and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and it's my privilege to welcome you into uh, the Trinity Broadcasting Network studio here in Orlando. I want to say in advance, I don't work for this station. I just am privileged to host these programs. But I want to say thank you to Trinity Broadcasting Network for making sure that local programming is experienced right here in Central Florida. Most of the programming comes from national and international ministries, but they are concerned about what God is doing right here in Central Florida, and that's what Joy in Our Town is all about. So we're so excited that you're with us today. This program just simply gives us reasons to put a smile on our face. You know, if you turn on the news, there are a lot of bad news that we listen to every single day. And so Trinity Broadcasting wants to make sure that you know that there are reasons to smile in Central Florida. And today is no exception. And we're going to talk about the family. So whether you are retired or you're married or you're single and you want to be married, this program is going to be for you. So for the next 28 minutes, why don't you just pull up a chair, sit down in your easy chair, get a cup of coffee, and let's spend some time together talking about how much God loves you and how God wants to work in your life. So I'm not going to be the one to talk today. I want to welcome to you uh, to our set today, this morning, Pastor uh, Joel Breidenbaugh, who is the senior pastor at Sweetwater Baptist Church. Welcome, Pastor. Right, thanks, George. We're delighted to have you this morning. Thank you. It's my joy to be here. Yeah, we, um, we're neighbors here in this city, and God is doing things all over. Sweetwater is, uh, is a congregation that I hear of quite often mentioned in people's conversations, and you have... You have been here for uh, a while, haven't you, in our city? Yeah, over eight years now. Eight years you've been uh, giving leadership there. Uh, today, let's talk about the family. All right. I mean, you're a pastor, and obviously a church is made up of, of individuals, and the context of those individuals are families. What is it, from your perspective, what does the family look like uh, as you stand Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and sort of talk to these people that sit in your uh, chairs, your pews at Sweetwater Baptist Church. What are you experiencing in their lives that you're trying to deal with? Yeah, well, they're dealing with a whole lot of different challenges from marriage and uh, the challenges that come in marriage, the different issues that I think we're going to talk about here in just a moment to parenting issues. You know, how do I, how do I raise my kids with the challenges of new technology always at their fingertips? Uh, being bombarded by the entertainment crazed culture that we live in. Uh, how can I effectively parent them? And then there's some that are retired or empty nesters and saying, okay, now that I'm moving to this stage of life, what do I need to be doing? How would the Lord use me in his work? And so, yeah, there's just a number of, of different issues they're faced with. And all of those issues produce stress and strain in Absolutely. people's lives. So um, I, I, we want to talk about two different things. So we're going to, let's, let's talk specifically about marriage struggles today. What, what, what do you think is the leading cause of, of marriage issues and struggles today? Yeah, well, uh, and before I answer that leading cause, there's three that most people focus on, but I think they're missing the picture. Most of the time they focus on marriage struggles of sex, finances, or in-laws. Right. And all of those can be challenging. But I think the number one issue is communication. Uh, is, is to communicate both ahead of time before going into the marriage as well as several times throughout the marriage to communicate just what do we expect of each other in these different roles and, wh and what do we expect uh, and how we relate and how we uh, have intimate moments together and how we handle our financial challenges that just about everybody in America is facing today. And then how do we deal with the families? Because you don't just marry an individual, you really marry into the family. And how can you better relate to those families? And so I think the key issue is communication and making sure people are talking and communicating about these, these matters. Okay, so we probably have people that are anticipating marriage. They may be engaged and they're going to get yep. married. Let, let's turn just this moment into a premarital counseling session. Can we do that? Okay. And I know we, we can't go into great detail, but if you were going to sit and, and I am the, the husband of a couple or I'm going to be the husband of a couple, what would you begin to talk to me about marriage? When I look at marriage, how should I enter into marriage and what should be my thinking about marriage? Yeah, well, one of the things I talk to the men about are, is the expectations of what a husband looks like in the marriage. I always turn to the scriptures. I look in places like Ephesians 5 and how the husband is to lead and lovingly sacrifice for his wife. And that's tough for guys to do. I mean, it's one thing for them to love, but to love in a sacrificial way and to lead in the home in that way as Christ led the church, 
Uh, that's something I really focus on and I really make sure they understand because we all fall short of it, but it doesn't mean we just set it aside and therefore don't try. We go ahead and say, hey, the Lord's called me to this. Let's see what I can yeah. do and let's see how God's grace can use me in leading this family. We know the statistics about uh, marriage pretty much in our nation, about 48 to 50 percent end yep. in divorce, and then it escalates with numbers of marriages. In fact, it goes up if you married the second time, right. divorce is higher in second and third times in the midst of it. Uh, do you think, Pastor, that um, it is a problem because we don't understand that marriage is a covenant? Could you, oh. you know, from that whole concept of going back in the beginning when God created Adam, what, what, what the covenant relationship of yeah. marriage, what does that mean at an altar when they stand and say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor? Yeah, well, I'm glad you talk about the covenant because the covenant is the agreement between two or more parties around whatever they're agreeing to do. And in this case, you look at Genesis 2:24, and it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And, and, and what we often forget is that there's actually an order to that. Leaving father and mother means you can take, you, you can now live on your own. You can provide for another. To hold fast is the same term that is used in Ruth chapter 1 when Ruth holds fast and clings to Naomi and makes a covenant commitment to say, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. Where you go, I'll go. I'm going to provide for you until I die kind of thing. It's that kind of covenant commitment, the same term is used there, and that's to be used in the home, and that's to be used obviously in a, in a wedding ceremony, but it, it helps build a foundation for that marriage, and then they become one flesh. They don't get it out of order. They do it in the right right uh, relationship that the Lord wants. I, I think that what's happened is that uh, movies and culture has sort of um, romanticized marriage to the point of it being a feeling rather than understanding it's a commitment. Absolutely. And if we get commitment, then the whole idea of marriage changes. What, what, um, how are Christian marriages ultimately then different from a a secular kind of relationship that people go into? What's the difference? Yeah, well, one of the things you mentioned a moment ago is uh, all marriages, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent is what Christianity Today recently said, uh, marriages end in divorce, 50 to, uh, 40 to 50 percent of those. But in Christian marriages, uh, we're seeing anywhere, and studies have shown anywhere from 72 to 88 percent are actually staying intact if that Christian couple attends worship regularly, at least once or twice a month or more, if they attend regularly, which simply shows that having Christ, having the Lord at the foundation and the center of your marriage makes all the difference. Doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. Doesn't mean you're not going to have the financial right. challenges and the in-law challenges and the sex challenges and all those other things, communication challenges. It doesn't mean you won't face those, but it means you face those with a different perspective. And so that, that's really encouraging uh, to, to know that if you come together in worship, there can really be a difference because when Christ brings two people together uh, and is at the foundation of their marriage, they tend to stick together because they understand more about that covenant commitment. And it is a commitment. The word love in Scripture most of the time means loyalty and allegiance kind of commitment, not the feelings and romance and sex, sexual thoughts and so forth. Yeah. I, uh, I remember some years ago, James Dobson, Focus on the Family, did this research, and it was just as you were speaking, came to me that he made the comment that research was done that families that pray together 80 seconds a day, the odds of divorce goes from one in five, or one, in, or one out of two, to one out of 1,500. Oh, wow. So just yeah. praying together, Pastor. I mean, yeah. it, it, we, we tend to think, I can pray 80 seconds. We can pray over meals for 80 seconds, you know, right. if we're together having a meal. But the thought is, is that we're together in the midst of it. Um, I know that the church oftentimes is a microcosm of our culture. So the people that are coming through your doors at Sweetwater Baptist Church are, uh, are people that reflect the, the culture and the community. How do you approach these kinds of things with your congregation, marriage and issues? Is there a strategy that you have or, or there are there, uh, kinds of programmings or classes that you're doing for folk there? Yeah, there are. We do offer classes periodically, but one of the things, and we offer them on an annual basis, we offer things like retreats or a, a seminar, a conference, a night out, focused just on, uh, on, on the couple. Uh, and one of the things I talk about uh, with our church family on a regular basis is you ought to be doing one of several things every year as a married couple to invest in your marriage. So you either go to a, like a half-day seminar or uh, an overnight conference or retreat or something. You just get away maybe and just focus on the two of you. Uh, maybe go through a counseling checkup, and, and there's a lot of men that say, hey, I don't need help. 
But sometimes it's not so much, okay, you're not struggling, but there are some things you can do to improve your marriage. I'm very few people would say, hey, on a one, scale of one to 10, my marriage is a 10. Most would say, okay, I'm a seven, an eight, a nine. Okay, what can you do to move it up a notch? And I think counseling can help like that. There's obviously books that I encourage people to read. And so there's things I say, and we're constantly telling people, hey, invest in your marriage. You, you've invested in other things in life. Invest in your marriage because when the kids are grown and gone, if you have kids, uh, when, when challenges in life come, that spouse most likely is still going to be with you. And uh, you, you want to make sure you, you uh, stay together with them. Give, give us um, two or three ways that they can invest in their marriage then. So if you were going to, I, Pastor Joel, I need some help. I want to yep. improve my marriage. What would, you, what would you say to me to help me to improve my marriage? Yep, so I would say there, here's, a, here's a list of Christian counselors we recommend. So you might want to go and, and sit down with them for a few sessions. Uh, we provide some financial help if people need that in our church. Uh, I, I, there's a few different books I would recommend, and I would say this is something you can use. And then I would turn around and say, go, you know, attend this conference or attend this seminar on marriage because I think it will be a big help to you. Pastor Joel, uh, we're going to have to take a break in a moment, but I want to show this book. You've written a book, The Joy of Jesus at Christmas. Yeah. Uh, and I know the holiday season is soon to be with us, but uh, w these are devotionals. Tell me about this. Yeah, it's a 31-day devotional written for December, and it's written for individuals, couples, but specifically families. A lot of the application areas are, if you have a family, these are ways in which you can take the holiday season and incorporate God's Word and God's truth into your, into your life and family. But, you know, I, I, I'm a Christmas. I, I was, my birthday's the day after, so don't forget that. You okay. can send me a gift if you want to do that. Now, um, and, and Christmas for me is something that's year-round, so this could probably work year-round, couldn't it? There are a lot of concepts in there that could, that could work, work year-round. Year Absolutely. You know, and, and I'm grateful that as a pastor that you're willing to uh, invest in your congregation and write things like this because so often uh, as a pastor you are the shepherd, you're the leader, and you people are looking to you for that opportunity to be able to know what to do and how to do it. I, I know that uh, the, the kingdom concept of, of uh, the church is we're a shepherd, you as yeah. pastor, and we have sheep. Yeah. So you've got to lead sheep, right? Absolutely. And uh, they are trusting you to lead them in the right direction. Well, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back, Pastor Joel. Okay. Uh, he's got some more to talk about. We don't want you to leave, but we want you to be thinking about uh, the next step. We go from marriage to family, and we have children. So I think we've got struggles in, with our children as well. So we're going to talk about that when we come back. But I want you to know that Pastor Joel is one of the reasons why there's joy in our town. Because Sweetwater Baptist Church is doing something to build the kingdom of God through investing and leading and teaching their people. So you can smile about that. Would you just take a moment, let us take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk more together. We want you to know that there is a good reason to have joy in our town. So you stay with us. We'll be right back. <clears throat> They'll test you. Try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait. And move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and it's a privilege to have uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Joel Breidenbaum with us today, who is the senior pastor of Sweetwater Baptist Church. Uh, pastor Joel, you have a, a master's degree. You have a Ph.D. in theology. You're a man that has prepared yourself. Uh, you find that to be necessary in the world in which we live, that pastors need to be trained and prepared to help people? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, there are so many different issues we face, and I think the more you can have yourself equipped by God's grace and what resources you have, I think the better prepared you're going to be in facing those challenges. I think that, that our culture has gotten so complex that we as pastors, we sort of believe that, you know, church was more in the earlier days. People just sort of felt like, well, uh, they'll preach and we'll get to know, but now we're having to actually help people to navigate, and education helps us do that in the midst of that. Um, let, let's talk about uh, now these couples. We talked about marriage in our first segment. Let, let's talk about the challenges that parents are facing today. Again, what I appreciate in talking with you and the reason why I'm glad you joined us today is that pastors really are where the rubber meets the road in our culture, in the spiritual leadership. 
So, you know, uh, when I was pastoring, I realized you talk to the kids and you find out a lot about the families. Yeah. So um, talk, what, what, do you, what are some of the struggles people at Sweetwater Baptist Church are facing in the culture and living in Central Florida? Yeah, so people at our church are facing what everybody else is facing. There's challenges, there's, there's authority issue challenges as to who they're going to listen to, who their children are going to listen to. Uh, because they're, uh, they're constantly being bombarded by television and social media and so forth in ways sometimes to even counteract what their parents are trying to teach them. As a matter of fact, we, uh, my wife and I, who've been married 20 years and have five children, w the first Bible verse we make them memorize, and we really hone in on Bible memorization, is Ephesians 6.1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And it's not that we think that one's more important than any of the other verses, because there's obviously a lot of great verses on who Christ is and what he's done for us. But we want them to understand that God has placed us in their lives to be the authority figure, to help teach them about the way of the Lord, and to help teach them about life in general. So that the first person they come to when they're facing struggles and challenges is not, let me Google this, or... Let, let, let me see if I can talk to one of my friends. Is we want them to come and talk to us. Now, we don't mind them Googling some questions. We don't mind them talking to their friends. We want them to know that, hey, we, God's placing in your life, and we're here to help you. We're here to make you and help grow you by the grace of God and the kind of uh, responsible people that God wants you to be. And so challenges, I think, like that are faced because of, of, of what, uh, what, our people, what our people face in this culture. We all know, living in a secular society, that... The one thing that the enemy wants to do is undermine authority. And uh, when that is done, um, how would you encourage, uh, other than memorization, how would you encourage parents that are dealing with children right now that may be in that rebellious phase of their life? Because I think we're all, we all struggle with rebellion. Absolutely. Well, a lot of times we, we don't say it with words. We will say, God, don't tell me what to do. You know, that kind of an attitude. How would you encourage a parent who is has a child right now that doesn't maybe want to go to church or they don't want to listen or they're struggling with authority in school. How would you help that family? Yeah, well, you know, discipline can both be positive and negative. Sometimes we hear the word discipline and we immediately back up and say, oh, I don't want that. Right. Um, but discipline can also be positive. I mean, sometimes discipline, whether you're old school and spank or whether you do timeouts or whether you uh, withhold certain rewards or certain things that kids like to play with, you know, there's things like that, but all of that, we think of an athlete, an athlete's disciplined, and they, they run sprints, and they do push-ups, and they do certain drills and exercises so that they're better, so that their team's better. And what we're trying to do with children when we discipline them is ultimately we're trying to, we're trying to help them be better in life as well as make our family stronger. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And so that's one thing I, we try to teach our children is, hey, it's just it's an expression of love, but we're doing this so that you can grow and, and, that, you, and that you can be, move beyond these issues of rebellion and these issues of authority that you're facing. And one of the things I also like, try to tell parents, because there are a number today that say, well, you know what, my child doesn't, doesn't want to go to church, doesn't want to go to worship or Wednesday night activities or whatever. And so, you know, I'm afraid if I force him to go, I'll push, push him away from church. Well, study after study shows just the opposite happens. If you don't make them go, when they get old enough, they're going to, they're going to decide, hey, it wasn't important then. Why should it be important now? Where if you force them and you do make them go, the same way you make them go to school, the same way you make them go to the doctor when they're sick, the same way you, know, you do some of these things and make them keep commitments, the Christian commitment ought to be one of your first commitments that you're willing to keep. And granted, there's going to be days they don't want to go. My kids, even in a pastor's home, don't always want to go. Uh, but they, they tend to grow through that, and then God gets a hold of their heart. Grace works, mercy works, love works. A good, loving faith community uh, surrounds them, and, and you see a lot of good things happen as a result of that. Well, let me throw a little curve here for a moment, because okay. I think that as a pastor to pastor, you and I have a, the same background. How influential is the parent's life and love for Jesus, influential in children's expectations and their attitudes as they grow in their faith. It is the number one influencer in a children's life is their parents and their relationship with Jesus. If, if parents just make them go to church or drop them off and leave and the kids see it's not important to mom and dad, most of the time they'll grow up and it really won't be that important unless God really gets a hold of their heart because what they're seeing, what they're seeing a few hours at church, they're not seeing mimicked in the home. Uh, my greatest influence in life were my parents outside the Lord Jesus, and the Lord used them. And, and I can't remember 
uh, nights that we did not have devotions together as a family. And my dad wasn't a pastor. My dad even wasn't a deacon at that point. He just knew he was to, called to raise his three boys in the way of the Lord. And he would read a Bible story to us. My mom would pray with us. And I remember that happening just about every night that we grew up. And mom would have us memorize scriptures. And we would get stickers or stars for memorizing. That's a big deal when you're four, five, six years old. Uh, and that made all the difference. And I saw how much they loved Jesus and how much they modeled that in, in sharing that. That's one of the reasons why I wrote this, wrote this book is to help families share Jesus together and share the scriptures together in, in devotion time together. Uh, that, that's a lost art, isn't it? Devotions, yeah. family devotions. We right. used to, uh, again, when, when I was younger, that was a big thing as you yeah. talked about you growing up in the midst of it. Uh, but today, what, let our viewers know, what does a family devotion really look like? Because yeah. I don't think that sometimes it's like a mini church service. Is yeah. that what family devotions are to be? Yeah, not really. For us, uh, and our kids are all different ages now. They range from 14 down to 5. But when they're toddlers, you know, it's, it's 5 or 10 minutes of devotion time. And it's, it's reading a Bible story. It's sometimes singing a song or, or letting them dance and play along to a song. And toddlers love doing that kind of stuff. As they get a little bit older, you start extending that time a little bit more. You move from a toddler Bible to, a, to an elementary age Bible to a middle school Bible school. And then as they become middle school and high school, you have enough time that, okay, let's sit down, let's, let's talk for 15 or 20 minutes. Or if you're just talking with our older ones, we can talk you know, 30 minutes, read scripture, ask key questions. What did, what did you hear this? What was this chapter about? And, and, and how does that, how's that gonna impact your life? What are you gonna do as a result of that? Those key questions and help them more internalize it. Cause now they're starting to process it differently than they did several years before. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is so challenging today in the church because you, the people that are coming, they're coming out of a culture that has already sort of laid a foundation, right? They, they've yeah. already, it, it, I hate the word, but it's true, somewhat of a brainwash. Yep. Culture has brainwashed people. How do you help someone that is viewing today that says, you know what, Pastor Joel, I, 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 what you're saying sounds good. I want that, but I don't know how to get from point A to point B in the midst of that. How would you, how do you lead your congregation in this spiritual growth and development so that they begin to understand the importance of their own personal growth and then the significance of the family. Could you give them some pointers to help yeah. them to know what steps they could take in the midst of that? Yeah, and so if they're starting off, they've never done family devotions or maybe they've not done, been consistent on discipline with their kids. I say one of the great things about the Lord is His mercies are new every day. And so He'll give us that mercy and, and we take that new day and we start a fresh start. So if we haven't been doing it before, start the next day. And just say, you know, I'm, I'm going to start today. I'm going to start, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to start tomorrow and do this. You miss a day, don't beat yourself up. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to just drive you down. It's not a condemnation. Yeah. yeah. He wants to drive you down. Just say, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Let me do it today. And start, and start small. If it's, if it's reading the Bible five minutes a day, that's, that's better than zero. Yeah. Hopefully you can build up and go a little longer, 15 or 20 minutes. But uh, a few minutes is better than zero. And just starting to talk with your kids about chapters in the Bible, start in the Gospel of John if you've never started anywhere else, go to the book of Acts, the book of Romans, um, and then and you spend a little time praying, and if you don't, you feel like, hey, I don't know how to pray, well, just pray for your own self and pray for your family's immediate needs. And then as you grow in that, other needs will become more important in your life, and you'll begin to pray for those as well, and it'll become more second nature for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we live, again, in a culture where people want they, they feel like it's got to be sort of perfect that God expects perfection when God isn't the God of perfection. He is a God of maturity and growth. Right. And if we're attempting to grow in the, in the midst of that. Um, we, we only have just a few minutes left. And so um, give me, uh, give our viewers just a few ways that they can help raise their children in the ways and in the, in the, in the direction of God in their lives. Just some pointers that they can begin to think about. Uh, to encourage them right now. Would you do that? Yeah, I think uh, one of those ways is spending a little time in the Word, family devotions, even if it just starts for a few minutes. But spending time, try to do it on a daily basis. If you, if you miss a day, don't beat yourself up. Another way is making sure church involvement is important. Now, if you just go to church and don't do anything in the home, it's not going to be nearly as effective. Uh, but go there. If you, if you have a Sunday night, if you have Wednesday night activities, whatever, uh, go there as much as you can. I realize there's other challenges in life, but go there as much as you can and help others influence your kids. Because that's one of the great things about the faith community is they're not just hearing it from us. They're hearing it from other people who are walking this same kind of journey and they've 
walked in their shoes and struggled with the same things and they can help those children out. And sometimes at certain ages, children will listen to those people before they'll listen to mom and dad. That's true. So it's helpful that way. If you could, I think those two big things and then just have some good Christian friends you surround yourself with to interact with on a regular basis, communicate with, and help hold you accountable and stuff, those are really influential and, and helpful in that Christian walk. Well, Pastor Joel, I wish we had another half hour, but we don't. We're just almost at the end of our time. But I know that as a pastor, you have a heart for people. And I'm just going to ask you to take a moment to encourage people that may have attempted and they've not done well or they're still moving uh, forward and they just need to be encouraged. And then would you pray for us before sure. we have to sign off? Sure will. Yeah. So as, as you think about what God has called you to do, whether it's a husband or a wife or a father or mother, uh, maybe you're a, a, a teenager and you're thinking about how can I better relate to mom and dad. You know, as I said before, start in the word a, a few minutes a day. Ask the Lord, Lord, please work in my life. You know, it's one of the great things about Lord is he's, he's, a, he's one who forgives when we fail. He's one that offers great peace to us uh, when we need uh, direction in life. He gives us guidance. I mean, he'll do those things for us if we simply trust in him and look to him. So let me encourage you to do that. He is the risen Lord, so we have great hope in that. And with that note, let's uh, bow our heads together for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for sustaining us, for building the family with marriages and with parenting and children. And Lord, I pray for these that are watching and listening that you would work in their lives. Help them as they commit themselves to you, as they look to your word and to the faith community to help them uh, grow stronger in their own walk and in their own uh, marriage and parenting. And Lord, we uh, thank you so much for all this. We thank you most of all for Jesus who gave his life for us and then rose again from the dead. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Pastor Joel, thank you so much for being with us. Pastor Joel is the pastor, senior pastor at First Baptist Sweetwater. If you don't have a church, why don't you check it out? Give them a call, uh, see what God is doing there. We are believing that God is going to take our time together today and bring revelation and transformation to your life, to your marriage, and to your family. So never forget, Trinity Broadcasting is here. They believe in you. They believe in what God wants to do today. So you just keep watching. You keep praying. You keep trusting. Thank you so much for joining us. There is a reason to have joy in our town today because of First Baptist in Sweetwater, and we want you to join us again next time. So until then, don't you ever forget it. Jesus loves you. He really does. Bye for now. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.